Today's speakers will be Major General Maria Gervais, Director of the Synthetic Training Environment Cross-Functional Team, and she will be joined by Brigadier General Michael Sloan, Program Executive Officer, PEO Stray, and Mr. Matt Clark, Director, Simulation and Training Technology Center. As a reminder, during the question and answer period, please wait until you have the microphone before asking your question. At this time, let's welcome Major General Gervais. Hey, well, so good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Oh, really? <laughs> Look, I'm going to get my energy from you. So let me ask that again. How's everybody doing this morning? Okay, great, because you know what? I, I am very honored to have with me my two teammates, Brigadier General Mike Sloan and also Matt Clark, our S&T uh, lead, who is helping us talk, um, be here to talk about the synthetic training environment. And look, if there's one thing I want you to know, I'm very passionate about what we are doing for, you know, in regards to the synthetic training environment, which is going to what, in my mind, is going to lead to the second revolution in training for our United States Army. You know, our first revolution was really the development of our live combat training centers. And that actually changed training for our Army. Steve, as we call it, synthetic training environment, has the same ability to ch lead to that type of change, a revolution in training for our Army. And I appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk to you about it. And I will tell you, in a very short period of time, we have made tremendous progress. And that's because we've had the opportunity to discuss it to talk about what we envision Steve being, to talk about what our biggest gaps are, and then our industry partners and our academia partners have been tremendous over the past year and a half, helping us refine the requirements, helping us understand what is in the realm of the tech technology, you know, in terms of where technology was and where it could go, and then also helped us get better costing data. And I will tell you, as being a synthetic training environment cross-functional team lead, with all of the expertise to be able to bring to bear on something so important for our Army is tremendous. And I think that's one of the benefits of the cross-functional teams and the, the um, Army Futures Command, is that our persistent stare on the limitations that we have in our current training environment and what we need to do to be able to enable multi-domain operations has allowed us to capitalize on the virtual and gaming industry, which is just exploding, to be able to bring you know, the synthetic training environment much sooner than we thought. So with that, I'm gonna go to my first slide and I'm not gonna talk about it, I'm just, go ahead, and, there you go. So what are we really trying to do and what's the vision for STI? And if you take a look at it, you know, the as is right now, the as is is based on 80s and 90s technology that was very good. However, it was stovepipe, stovepipe proprietary. We're trying to link it together and it actually uses terrain differently. So we have a lot of limitations in our virtual, which is in the blue. We also have to integrate that. That means we're trying to hook it together to make it work with our live, which is in yellow, and also our constructive, which is our big warfighter exercises. That requires uh, us to do a lot of integration, which means we have, we're tied to facilities, we have a large overhead, and we can't deliver this to the point of need, nor are we able to replicate the operational environment because we cannot uh, use emerging technology to bring it in as quick as we need to. So we're going to go to the 2B. The 2B is to deliver this training to the point of need. Wherever a commander or soldiers or units need to train, that's where they need to be able to train at. We also want to get to common data, common standards, an open architecture, and we want to get to common terrain, which is one world terrain, because if we lay that foundation, which you see on the right side of the slide, if we lay that foundation, that will allow us to bring in our reconfigurable virtual collective trainers, which are gonna replace our CCTT, our AVCAT, our air and ground platforms. It's going to allow us to bring in a soldier squad virtual trainer. Our squad virtual trainer is part of the integrated visual augmentation system. So think of a squad immersive event so we can train a squad in simulations. And then a soldier virtual trainer, which is going to combine the call for fire, which is in the blue on the left, it's going to combine the engagement skill trainer, and it's also going to bring in a use of force capability for our military police and others that have to be trained in that. 
And we believe if we set our foundation, we bring in our virtuals, that's gonna set the stage for us to eventually bring in our live environment, our force on force, force on target. So think about miles engagement systems. And then our future constructive environment or simulation, which we need to be able to improve so we can do multi-domain operations. And so that's what we're trying to do and move towards. Because if we do that, we know we can deliver it to the point of need. We know we can be more responsive to commanders. We can give them the terrain that they need to train on when they need to train on it. And we can also reduce a lot of the overhead that we currently have and move beyond some of the limitations we have in our current training environment. So on the next slide, the next slide will talk about some of the things we've been able to do with your help over the past year and a half as we stood up the cross-functional teams. You know, we were able to put our capability development documents in place. We developed an initial capability de uh, development document very uh, quick, and we were able to staff that through the building uh, within 11 days. We developed our capability development uh, document within six months across the Army, and that helped inform what we were going to do in our very first other transactional authorities that we put in place. And so we went through almost about a, about a year working with our partners, working with um, industry and academia, and that resulted in user assessments where soldiers that were going to use this equipment put their hands on this equipment and told us, is this the right approach? Is this where we need to go? How do you need to change it? And is technology mature? Where does it need to mature more? What are the gaps? And then on top of that, it gave us good costing data on how much this was going to cost. So the end result in April and May is we went to Fort Carson, we went to Fort Riley, and we came down to Orlando with all of the units. They told us technology is, more, is a little more mature than we thought, and we can go into rapid prototyping. It also told us that our requirements, we needed to change a little bit, and here was the best approach. And the soldiers said this, what we're doing, will help them in the execution of their job right now. So they saw value added in it, and it helped us understand what it was that we needed to provide to our soldiers so that they could train. And so what that has led to is now we're, we're finalizing our capability development documents. We're working with our material developer and our S&T partner where we put in a set of follow-on other transactional authorities so that we can actually move beyond this and Mike Sloan is going to talk to you about the acquisition process. And then it also helped us identify the gaps that we needed to focus on and ask industry and academia to help us solve these tough challenges so we can actually improve what we're doing right now. So very successful in my mind because it helped me understand which approach to take. And number two, to put this in the hands of soldiers. And when they tell you a couple things, when they say this will help me in execution of my job right now, is great. When you put One World Terrain prototype in their hands and they say, yeah, this was good for training, but now we see a tr uh, tactical use for it, that tells you that you're on the right path. And we're very, uh, we're very encouraged by the things that we're doing um, with all of our partners to move to the synthetic training environment. Because it will be a second revolution in training, because it will help um, improve home station training. It will allow us to go into the live training env environment at a much higher level of proficiency, and it will help us overcome some of the limitations that we have in training right now. And so that's going to go to the next one. Here is one I want you to just kind of focus on. Go to the next slide. Because what we need to do to improve our live training environment, so think about force on force, force on target. So think instrumentation. Think about our miles system. Think about laser. Look. We've been relying on 1970s, 80s, 90s engagement systems. So think laser tag, a little more sophisticated than that, but think in that line. But we have been relying on that since the 70s and 80s. It's not, you know, the realism isn't there. It doesn't have the accuracy. We can't really train in this environment the way we need to. We, we are challenged to do indirect fire and go from live to virtual and vice versa. So we want to focus on our live training environment and what do we need to do better in the live environment to be able to replicate that environment to allow a BCT to be able to train, to use the capabilities that they have at the, their disposal without having to limit what they need to do. And so live is one of our b efforts. Our Army senior leaders have asked us to accelerate this because quite frankly, miles is good. It's time consuming, it's costly, 
and it takes away from the t precious time that units have to train because it, it's platform, it's not platform agnostic, it's platform specific. We have to move it around, and quite frankly, it's just, it's, it's, it's a burden. And so we need to move to something that's not, you know, beyond laser-based, see if we can find other technologies out there that can solve our problem and, and is better than what we have. And that's my challenge to you, is that we need to get after that. So I, I'm going to turn it over because we have a lot of ch gaps and challenges for you, and I'm going to turn it over to my S&T partner because he's going to talk to you about some of the key gaps that he sees and he's working on. Matt? Hey, thank you, ma'am. Hey, Matthew Clark, uh, Director of Simulation Training Technology Center down in Orlando, Florida. Next slide, please. So General Drigvay gave us uh, a very significant challenge with respect to the S&T. And, and how do we support the STE CFT in the timeline and it's running? And believe me, it is running at a fast pace. IOC basically in about 18 months. So closing the gaps. So our, our focus on the S&T side is obviously short term today, closing those critical gaps that we see that will get to IOC and FOC and then following on and shaping the future and creating that technology that's going to keep the STE, you know, an enduring system, and it'll be a growth system as well. So short term, General Gervais up at the top left already discussed what we were doing on the STE CFT and her vision. Down below, you see some of the efforts that the S&T is providing right now. One World Terrain. So what are we doing? We're working those automated processes for data collection and, and, and data data distribution and processing. So we want to get the man out of the loop when it comes to creating a synthetic environment. And, and when we talk synthetic training environment, I'm talking three-dimensional, exterior, interior, complex environments as well, cities, jungles, those type of things. So it's, it's automating the process to get that terrain data from a capture into the hands of a warfighter in a, in a very short time. TSS, TMT, the backbone of the STE. Training simulation software, training management tools. The software side. Today, we are looking at models, applications, scalability. All those things are gonna make the backbone and the architecture of the STE work. And, and when we talk scalability, I'm not just talking about ramping up the size of entities, but ramping up the capability of the applications, ramping up the models to accept those applications, and somewhat shaping the architecture of the STE itself that goes behind it. TMT, think applications on your iPhone. The tools that a commander or a trainer is going to use. What we want to do is automate the process of both setting up a training scenario, assessing that a training scenario, and then giving automated feedback. So we're doing work today at both the individual and team level with respect to intelligent tutors and automated scenario generation those type of things. So you run an event, you get feedback at the team level while that event's taking place, and it's captured, you get feedback afterwards, and then you get a tailored scenario after the fact to help you improve. SSVT, virtual trainer. Our focus is dynamic occlusion, the spatialization, and the tracking in the virtual world. If we don't get that right, if we do not get that correct, it impacts live training as well, and I'll explain that in just a little bit. So let's cross over to live. Joan Jove talked about getting rid of the mile system, going into something else. We want to take live engagements, bring it into the network. We're working on the concept of what we call the e-bullet. So we're doing weapons orientation sensors that will go into the weapon itself so that we get azimuth pose of the weapon. And we're doing the algorithms that will give us the ballistic characteristics of the weapon and then we'll do an engagement across the network. Key to that is one world terrain that's gonna come into play. If you're gonna have a successful engagement, you have to understand the terrain between the target and the shooter. And then uh, finally, the live piece, uh, one other piece on that is, is the ability to link with IVAS and, and have an experience, a virtual experience actually in the live scenario. So what do I mean by that? A shooter, so let's say an anti-tank weapon system, will shoot a tank. While they're wearing the IVAS, they will actually see the, the effects of that explosion in a virtual environment through the IVAS goggles themselves. So let's talk about the future, those technologies shaping the future. General Gervais and I work very closely shaping where we need to go. And it changes almost every day. And it changes because of the technology growth across the industry, 
and our partners and across what we're doing in the military as well. But you see the four areas that we're looking at right now. Live engagement, not gonna go away. We're gonna have to scale up, going from individual engagements to teams to even larger echelons that we're gonna do. Future constructive simulations. We have to do these constructive simulations so that they're seamlessly integrated at any level of the unit. And we do get those training experiences that we actually need. Individual training and teaming assessments. Once again, the assessment piece, we have to automate it. We have to take the human experts out of the loop, replace them with AI experts that are gonna do the same job, reduce the level of manpower. And then finally, leader development. Critical, MDO is coming and we need to shape our leaders to do it. So we need a method to train and educate those leaders at a faster pace than we've ever done before. So let's talk about process on that. Next chart, please. S&T's really changed inside this DCFT. You see, we'll start on the top left with the focus areas, and, and those focus areas are somewhat enduring. But what's changed is this continuous process that we go through now. It used to be somewhat linear. It is no longer linear. We come in, we identify the gap, and we assess that gap against what industry can provide. And if that gap is truly a military or an army specific gap that we should be expending critical resources against. Because if it's not, it doesn't meet our, our level of, of need. Then we go into our, our process of how we're gonna execute. And we do it one of a couple ways. We either do it in-house, we do it as a collaboration with industry, or we just contract out to industry and then we continue to monitor that and assess. We assess it through user assessments, we assess it through stage gates, through s and reviews that we do continuously, and then we may change. And it is not unheard for us in midstream to stop an s and effort and shift focus. And we do that based on the requirements at hand because we are in a very dynamic process. Finally, we work at transition. Transition to us is critical. If we can't get our product out the door, into the hands of, the, of that vendor that requires it, our s and effort is, is pretty much invalid. With respect to OTAs, it's a little bit different process now. We as an s and organization have to align with the agility cycle of our OTA vendor, and we have to produce a product that one, has the data rights that can go, two, is mature enough to enter into their program of, of record, and, and three, uh, uh, adds value to them. Because if it doesn't, it's not gonna be an acceptable transition. So very challenging piece here. So that's it for the S&T side. I'll be followed by General Sloan. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everybody. I'm Mike Sloan, the Program Executive Officer for PEO STRI, uh, Simulation, Training, and Instrumentation. And um, before I start, what, what I'll talk about briefly is um, uh, General Gibson was before me, and I think it's key what he mentioned, right? So you gotta have a requirement, you have to have funding, and then you have to have the authority and the approval ability to move forward with what we have. So, so all those things are happening under the cross-functional teams under the Army Futures Command. And so what we've got, we've got an Army Futures Command, commanding general making decisions to prove requirements at pace and speed that we've never seen before. So sir, thank you very much. We appreciate the support in getting that done. So those are three things that you need. So let me tell you what's unique about and when I got the assignment to PEO Stry, and I said, where is that? Because I'm, I'm also a Fort Drum guy, right? 10th Mountain Division. I said, where is PEO Stry? Of course I knew. Um, it's in Orlando, right? So pretty cool assignment. But let me tell you what's really cool about it. In order to execute those things that we just talked about, guess what we have? We have Joan Gervais, the CFT director right there. We have Matt and his whole S&T community right there in Orlando. But guess what else we have? We've got Army Contracting Command right there with us and the PEO. And we're all in an area probably as big as half of this floor right here. So we are talking all day and all night, right? And literally all night. John Gervais will send me a note at 2 o'clock in the morning. What do you think of this, Mike? I'm like, hold on, ma'am. Hold on. Trying try to get 30 minutes of sleep here. Um, so, so it's absolutely awesome, the speed at which we can bring this together. So what I'd like to do, how much time do I have remaining? About, ish, five minutes? Five, about five, okay. So what, what I'd like to do, if you go to my slide, my part's the easy part, this is the acquisition part. And, and so I'm gonna walk you through a 12-step process that we're following. We presented this last year, and I showed this to General uh, Vangel one time, and he said, God, this is tough. But when I walked him through it by the numbers, right, color by the numbers, and we're able to color this in by the numbers, it makes sense. 
So 12 steps starting here, one all the way around through the process to 12. This is a depiction of the acquisition strategy that's in draft right now that we've shared with the acquisition executive, Dr. Jetty. But I want to share with you the path that we're on because about this time last year, we said this is what we're going to do. And General Ray said these are the capabilities we're going to develop. And the S&D community said this is what we're going to work on. Fast forward to now, I'm going to show you everything that we said last year we're going to do, we have in fact done, right? As a matter of fact, we've even pulled in some more capabilities sooner than we thought. So if you start over here at the number one, what you'll see is we have a whole bunch of activities going on here. These are OTA awards, right? Other transaction agreements that we've awarded. And so across all of these lines here. Well, we started way back here with what General Gervais said back in February of 18. Then we went through um, the April, May user's assessment, which then informed the requirements. So these OTAs are allowing us to inform the requirement, test the technologies, and then on top of that, refine the requirement, and then see what industry is able to do. So we awarded competitive OTAs. Those are ongoing now, and if you look through the gray areas, a little tough to see, but the gray areas here, a bit, a bit of our way into two, is where we are. So we're assessing those technologies now. What we're going to do is we're going to build this over a course of time. Instead of saying we're going to go all the way to the end acquisition process and then evaluate and test and say, oh, it passed or it failed, we have iterative processes. And through the iterative processes of six capability sets, as we're working to get to the initial operational capability here in September 2021, we're evaluating the processes. We're bringing them in. We're looking at them individually and then collectively. Do they interoperate together? How do they work together? So we're doing that process here. And in effect, what we're doing, for those of you who know the acquisition process, you'd go way down the line about eight years, and then you set up your preliminary design review and say, hey, what is my entrance criteria to get into my preliminary design? What's my exit criteria? Well, guess what we're doing? We're just calling it a design review right here, a DR, design review. And these are happening after every one of these efforts, we're going to have six, basically, preliminary design reviews, right? Iterative. And what those are going to do is they're going to inform from a tactical standpoint, are we meeting the requirement? Do we need to adjust the requirement? From a technical standpoint, what does industry need to adjust? What do we need to address? And then do we need to change where we're going into the next user's assessment? So it allows us to work on our preliminary design well before getting into an actual meeting effort where we say, this is the design. So if you look here, these are all working simultaneously, and then what happens is after the iterative process of six of those, we'll move into what we're calling our critical design review, which most of you know you go into your critical design review. And as we work through those, we'll go into a limited production. That may be based off of those OTAs. We can award right off of those because those were, in fact, awarded through a competitive process, or we may go out full and open on those, right, through FAR contracts, determination to be made. Then we get into the whole synthetic training environment, the increment one, which is what we're going to deliver at IOC. So you go through here, we bring all those together, and then we're going to culminate with a test event here to make sure that we are, in fact, ready to go into the initial operational capability to deliver all those capabilities that you saw General Gervais and Mr. Clark talk about here. That's September 21. Critical to note, right? So everything is funding dependent, right? And so many of you know, and uh, no secret, right, public knowledge that we, we are facing some marks right now. So given those marks, depends what uh, comes out of the next few weeks and months, right, we'll determine how fast we can, in fact, get here and what, in fact, we can start pulling even faster to the left. So following the initial operational capability, we then feel that capability, then we'll make another decision. Okay, now do we transition to a FAR contract, FAR-based contract, as many of you are familiar with? Um, do we down select? Do we do something that's competitive in that event? Do we do a sole source? Is that needed? Or do we do some or all of it as training as a service? Right? So all that's written in the acquisition strategy and have decision points along the way that we'll be briefing senior leaders to make sure that we deliver this capability on our, on our path right now to, to the uh, uh, full operational capability here, which includes all those um, capabilities and bringing additional capabilities into the fold. So fully transparent what we're doing here. Um, the OTA process is different. Uh, I know it is, but we're open to discuss with industry anything that you want to bring forward to us, ideas that you have, and we'll consider that as we go forward. So I think, um, so I'm out of time, so I'll pause, and I think we're going to open up for questions. Yeah, so as um, we're getting ready to move towards the questions, so I'll just uh, kind of end this piece with this. So, you know, yes, our schedule's aggressive, and I'm not going to apologize for that in no way, shape, or means. Because, you know, we have some things that we need to improve in our training environment, and we need to improve it today, now, and also into the future. But I'm not going to apologize because, see, I know. I've seen what 
you, the industry and academia partners have been doing. I've seen how you've been moving in that direction and where the market is going. And I believe, and I firmly believe, that we can do this faster than we had originally anticipated, which was between 2025 and 2030. Okay? And I'm convinced that, the, you know, the, we put the challenge out there to you. You're going to solve it. The other piece I'll say is that our commitment to you is that we want to do better outreach. And as we're down in Orlando co-located, we're developing an integration facility, which will allow us to have better outreach with our industry and academia partners. You'll be able to bring your uh, capability or technology in to quickly be assessed. And if it can quickly integrate into the synthetic training environment, that's the path that we would like to take. Now, it's not up and running yet. We're still under some renovation. But we're trying to get that online because I know that will help you, that will help us, and that will help my teammates assess the technologies that are out there um, much quicker than, you know, the 10,000 trips that we're taking to go see you or you to come see us. So we're looking for a better way on that. So with that, um, we have uh, about, uh, for, about 10, 15 minutes for uh, questions. What I would ask is if you have a question, just wait until you get a mic, please. Okay, so if, if I had my coin, I would out. give it to you, so break in the ice. Oh. Travis Kloffenstein, University of Iowa, one of the academia partners. Uh, can you describe a little bit more how the, uh, how the STE will apply to uh, soldiers for mission uh, operations, mission rehearsal? So outside the training environment, as a cross-functional team, it seems to have many other uses for the acquisition process in general and for operations. Yeah, so, um, so we believe that, you know, um, going through our one world terrain effort with being able to replicate the terrain at a level of fidelity, that that will lead to things like mission planning, rehearsals. You can also do line of sight. You can do route planning. You can figure out where the enemy is, where the enemy isn't. That you can see if they're there, can they see me, yes or no? And quite frankly, um, we have given the One World Terrain prototype that we have. It's right now it's uh, Naval Special Warfare. We have RSOF. We have Army divisions that it's in their hands right now. Our uh, asymmetric warfare uh, group is using it right now to capture terrain. And also we have Marine battalions that are using it. So what happened is they started with training but they quickly saw the utility of what they could do from an operational standpoint. And then on top of that, as we looked at the integrated visual augmentation system, what we found was the 3D terrain, the richness of that terrain and what it could provide over the 2D terrain, you know, the value added there was, um, you know, was very beneficial to the execution of not just the training mission, but the tactical mission rehearsal. And quite frankly, we're working with our Air Force partners and joint staff partners because they're looking at it right now for targeting. So something that we originally thought for training, because look, I was just trying to get away from 57 different terrain formats in all these different legacy platforms we had, and I called it one. One terrain format in all our simulations and simulators. Okay, one didn't mean actually tactical. It didn't actually mean targeting. Okay, but guess what, it grew into that? And if that's the case and it can be value added, can be a game changer, then we ought to take advantage of that. So that's kind of uh, one of the ways that we've seen it. The other way that we've also seen it too is our reconfigurable virtual collective trainers. Right now, we're challenged. We can do limited air ground uh, co coordination between our platforms because of the differences between them. What we're seeing right now is what the work that we've just done initially we're already seeing air ground coordination being able to be done. Some of our uh, feedback we got from our units up at Fort Carson was, hey, my gosh, I could do mum tea with this right now. So, you know, those things can all help you go from just training to a mission rehearsal. Mikey, want to add anything? I, I would just say that, you know, knowing that up front, we're in the right environment right now to be able to pull this off with the requirements, right, across the requirements community, um, with the Army Futures Command, Joan Gervais, and the team looking across all the platforms, all uh, right, we, that would hardly ever have happened before. So now that we can look across all the platforms, 
and have the requirements generators at the Army Futures Command driving that from an acquisition process, right, then we can then say, okay, what does that mean for the community, the acquisition community, and how can we um, bring in those capabilities and then distribute those and test those to get it out to everybody at the same time. So, yeah. Yep. Ma'am, um, Mike, let's get a, oh, oh I'm sorry, sorry. Great, uh, sorry. and this may we'll be a, a follow on to the answer just provided, but thinking about all those capabilities, the, the network component, the, uh, the ability to enable uh, these things to happen, uh, enterprise, tactical, uh, I, maybe the question isn't you know, precisely how is that going to happen, but what are the mechanisms uh, in place to ensure that that moves with the speed that the synthetic training environment needs to? Yeah. Hey, so that's a, that's a great yeah. question. But I would say, first of all, I think the, the beauty is, you know, being a cross-functional team and we're one of the eight aligned to soldier, the sixth modernization priority, um, which is soldier lethality, but we are a cross-cutting CFT. So we have our network teammates that are with us every step of the way. We are laying out right now what do we think the requirement is going to be in terms of bandwidth and also latency we have to overcome. And let me just start off by saying, look, I, I should, probably should have said this in the beginning. What we're trying to do, it's not easy, but I would also say it's not impossible. Okay, because see, what we're seeing right now is technology is coming out that's you know, increasing bandwidth, doing better data management right now so that you're only sending what you need. We're also seeing better capability to overcome latency. And then we work with our, our partners, CIO G6, our PEO EIS, C3T, and we've been working very collaboratively across the board to include the Corps of Engineers and ERDIC. We're also working with Army Geospatial. We're working with National uh, the NGA on all of this. So we're looking for what are the ways that we can deliver this, what are the gaps that we have, and what are the things we need to overcome so that we can actually do this. So we are network dependent. Network, we know that. Enterprise level, we're synced with our CIO G6 on infrastructure upgrades that need to take place. We're looking at 5G. We're looking at all the things that can help uh, bring this together. Because we're seeing you know, just an emergence in technology that is gonna overcome what used to be some very, um, you know, some severe limitations in where technology could be used and where it couldn't. Okay, but we're not done. We're not gonna say it's gonna be perfect, we're gonna evolve. But we've also stood up a STE network integration pilot using a testing network right now. That got stood up and became operational two weeks ago. So we already started pushing our data, pushing our terrain and saying, how much is it? What does it take? Where are the pitfalls? Where are the choke points? Why are they and how can you overcome them? Because my whole premise is stop talking on PowerPoint, start doing, and you'll figure it out, right? Okay, but we'll talk ourselves to death on PowerPoint, won't we? Well, at least we will. We will. So, Mike, you want to add? Yeah, or thank you, ma'am. Matt, too? Matt, did you want to jump in? I've got a couple words I'll say. Uh, I think um, I'll, I'll sum up what General Gervais said. Um, from, from my, if I was out there, uh, my takeaway was, hey, there, there's not one solution, right? So I think you, you heard ITN. I think you heard 5G. I think you heard uh, PEO, Enterprise Information Systems, EIS, right? And, and uh, that's, uh, of course, Ms. Cherie Smith. And then she has um, Victor Hernandez working there. And so we're looking at what do you need out of an installation? What do you need at a combat training center? What do you need when you're forward deployed? Maybe it's all of that, right? So maybe maybe you are having to do some infrastructure. Maybe you haven't used some of the the, um, the the tactical network. Maybe you are having to actually use some uh, network capability as a service. And so when you look across where we're going to be and how we're going to deliver that capability, it's going to be, I think, a combination of all of those and working through all those right now. Yeah, I'll just add on that on, on, on the technology side, the S&T side. It's really working technical challenges in real time. And, and, and how do we do this? So it's key that we partner with industry to get after those challenges as we see fit. So for instance, latency and, and distributed gaming, let's call it, right? Being able to distribute training across the network. So we, we team today with, with Microsoft and with Google and, and, and we figure out how they're doing it on the, on the gaming side of the house and then we start chipping away on, on how do we transfer that to, to turn it into a military application. So, you know, I've got PhDs out there that are, that are doing that 
constantly in, in traveling and, and, and teaming with industry. The other piece I want to bring in is we, we've got another a great asset that, that we have, and it's a UARC, right? A University Affiliated Research Center out at the University of Southern California, the Institute for Creative Technology. They help us do some of that stuff. Part of it is the modeling and, and, and the applications and the algorithms that go into that. And so, you know, we work with them, uh, great professors out there, experts in their field that help us once again tackle those, those significant technology challenges. I'm Louisa Jaffe from TAPE. I have a question for you, General, and for Mr. Clark specifically. <clears throat> Excuse me, could you talk for a minute about uh, instructional design and content development, uh, curriculum design? Is that something the Army's going to handle in-house, or are you open to, go to industry ideas? So first of all, um, I, I would say that we have to be careful in-house. So. I, I will tell you, if I had to grade Steve being successful, there are two things that I've kept my eye on every step of the way. Number one, it's got to be the user experience. If the user experience is not right, they will not use it, and you know, will not, we will not have the same outcome that we need. Number two, content is going to be king. So content is something that we've been paying, watching very closely. How do we develop those scenarios? How are we going to do it? I don't have the full answer on that. I just know that that is something that is very important. We've got to figure out how we're going to do it, how we're going to govern it, and then how do we introduce the scenarios and the content that allows us to be able to train in, from all, every echelon, you know, in different environments, different space and time, different uh, training levels. We, we've we've got to be able to figure that out. And that's part of that training management tool. And if you think about it right now, simulations and what we're seeing with wearables, they're going to become very um, probably, you know, be adapted because of a couple things. Number one, we're getting back to the, you know, now a little bit of the better field of view and getting to a better comfort level and things like that. Number two is the software development kits that go with them that now gamers and everybody else is jumping on and developing that software development kit. And that gives so much flexibility and always keeps the, uh, the ability to change. And then number three is probably going to be in the telecommunications area that is going to propel all three of these. So, you know, I think as we're working through this, we've got to have a good way to develop content, manage content, and keep it um, relevant is some of the key things I'm keeping on. Now I'll turn it over to them that have the hard part. I just give the vision and they figure out the hard part yeah, of it. So I'll, I'll jump in that. So, so from the S&T perspective, my job's not to create the content, right? That, that is a, a user piece. My job is to create the technology that enables content development and, and gives the feedback. So we're doing that today. Today we're working at the individual level and I, I, I think we've, we've pretty much accomplished that and, and solved that and that is not by any means a completely in-house effort. That is done with our partners both on industry and on the UARC side of the house. So we have to open that door now and, and talk about AI, right? AI is part of this and it's the machine learning piece that's gonna go on. The holy grail for this, the assessment piece and the content piece is really building it for teams, first small teams and then start scaling up to larger and larger. And it's that individual interaction of each team and we have to figure out, is a team successful because all the players did the right thing? Or are they still successful and they all did the wrong thing and, and what it all means? So today, on the team side of the house, we're working very hard to figure out what those metrics are. How do you measure this? How do you measure performance starting at the individual level, building up to the team interaction level, and figuring out what an outcome is, and then be able to take that and predict future outcomes? and then influence those future actions, outcomes, excuse me, through training events that will then be automatically developed that, that will take that data, that huge amount of data, and compile it and then be able to put it into a usable form. Hey, so we're about out of time. Mike, any closing comments? I'm, I'm good with that, yeah. ma'am. Hey, so ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you very much for taking out of your busy time to be here. Uh, you know, I started this off with saying I'm very passionate, and I just want to share just two things with you and kind of how we think about this and how the team 
you know, that has been given this mission to deliver what's in the Army vision, which is deeper distribution of simulations down to the company level so we can increase the reps and the sets um, so we can improve lethality and survivability. I mean, that's kind of what's in the Army vision. That's what we've been chartered to do. So as we think about this and we think about where we're at in a point in time, so we think about being the ones that are able to be part of this change. This change that is going to revolutionize the way we train, but in our minds is also going to be a generational change for our Army. And so we can't do it alone. All the progress that we've done to date has been because of the great teamwork, you know, uh, with the CFT, with our, our partners, and with our industry and academia partners. But in my mind, if we get that foundation correct, and we get the common data, common standards, and open architecture, and common terrain, boy, the t we have just seen the tip of the iceberg of what the synthetic training environment can do and all the different capabilities it can bring to bear for our Army, and I'm going to submit also for some of our sister services and our joint and, um, and our coalition partners. I think it's going to be that powerful. So uh, we want you to be part of that change and help us. So thank you.